Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. It's an honor and a blessing to be able to talk to you and meet some new faces in the community that I live in. I have a, a brief little PowerPoint that I'll go through just to give you an overall refresher on Habitat and some of the projects that we're working on. If you have any questions at the end, um, I'll stay for your coffee hour and hope to meet a few of you. Um, so we'll go ahead and begin. So this is Habitat for Humanity, Grand Traverse Region. We service uh, Traverse City, Kalkaska, and Leelanau counties. We have a mission of seeking to put God's love into action, and we are focused on homes, communities, and hope, and instilling that back into the communities we are around. Our vision uh, we share a vision of a world where everyone has a safe and decent place to live and where housing, poverty, and homelessness are eliminated. We can see this in today's world more and more, unfortunately. The struggle continues to grow to find a safe and affordable place to live. And I'm sure many of us know someone who is also facing this at this time. Habitat is dedicated to eliminating poverty housing uh, locally by constructing, rehabilitating, and preserving homes. Those are our three areas where we try and focus. Um, advocating for fair and just housing policies as we try and advocate to um, commissioners, county members, to the state so that people are aware of what's going on in our communities and help be a voice for everyone. We provide training and resources to help households improve their living conditions offering educational seminars that help educate individuals on skills and abilities uh, to help lead a safe and secure life. What we do, we are located in Traverse City. We serve the Grand Traverse, Leelanau, and Kalkaska counties. We do new home construction, uh, rehabilitations, critical home repairs, home buyer support, and mortgage sessions for our partner families. Who do we serve? Households that are unable to obtain conventional house financing. Not everyone can go through a traditional mortgage process and come out successful in the end. It is quite a rigorous process, so we try and help uh, as best we can, uh, sometimes often using uh, USDA mortgage options, which are um, a little bit more lenient on lower incomes. Existing homeowners who are unable to afford critical home repairs, households with incomes ranging 30 to 80% of the area median income. That is the community that we are focusing on serving. And each, um, each county has a different criteria. So Leelanau, 30 to 80% would reflect differently than Kalkaska, 30 to 80%. Uh, that way it's a, a fair look over rather than lumping them all together as Leelanau County and Traverse City tend to be a little bit higher than Kalkaska County. Uh, so how does it work? Habitat is a hand up, not a handout. We do not go around passing out keys to homes. We encourage the partner families to be active, involved. They are building their home, they are building stability, and building a long-term solution for themselves. So they do have that mortgage, which falls into 30% of their gross income. They are required to do 200 sweat equity hours, which could be facilitated on the job site, in the community, at our ReStore, uh, coming to events with us to speak about the Habitat mission. And households that receive uh, repair services in our priority home repairs, they pay back a portion um, of their uh, bill after the process with a 0% interest to help them uh, move further along in their life. Some habitat facts. Habitat builds homes in partnership with those in need, regardless of family size, makeup, or household. We do not look at um, race, ethnicity, religion, um, or faiths or no faiths. Anyone can qualify for this. Our program outcomes, um, a few interesting 
facts here. Uh, all clients must complete courses necessary for successful home ownership. We have an increased educational attainment and an increased health and wellness. The statistics show that families that grow up and, and children specifically that grow up in a safe and stable home, they will do better in school. They will do better in the community. They feel more comfortable. They have a safe and reliable place to live. So we are truly grateful that we can have this program running in our community and we hope that you can help us keep it going. Our current projects, uh, the first one is a Maple City, which is um, not too far from here. There are three duplexes being put up right now uh, that will serve six families in our community. We have a few that are single mothers with a few children, and then we have a few single individuals. And our last duplex, we are still looking for our partner family for that. But there are two in the works right now of the three. The next slide will show you a picture rendering of what the project will look like. Um, they've got a single car garage in between. It's a really nice sound buffer. We try and make the homes energy efficient as best we can because as we know, utilities can also be a big burden on families. And so anything we can do to keep their cost of living down, we will do our best. The next photo is well, the next slide is a couple of photos from the Maple City Project. It's been an honor of my own to come out and work alongside some of the volunteers that have been helping us get these projects up and going as fast as we can. We'd like to complete the first duplex by November and get this family in in 2022. So we have a lot of work ahead of us, but we are pushing through. This is all uh, groups from there. Um, our next current project is New Waves Community Church is a partnership with New Waves Community on the corner of 72 and Bugai. This will be a larger project of 14 homes with six homeowners and eight rentals from the church. So this will be the next project after our Maple City. And we have not selected all of our partner families for that, but we have not um, put the foundations in yet. So to be fair to those partner families, we will start selecting next year. Um, and the next photo is a rendering here of what the individual homes will look like. And then this is a kind of a neat project because on the right side of this second photo is an opening space. And we're doing our best to keep that as natural as possible. So they, the kids that live there or anyone who lives there has space to play in the grass, walk uh, along the, the trail that we'll put in and, and enjoy nature. We're not trying to disrupt and put in condominiums. We're trying to put in some homes and then also offer opportunities for them to enjoy the nature and the beauty that we all live in. The next one is, uh, this is just completed, our Williamsburg Estates project. We have three homes in Williamsburg that were just completed, three single family homes um, all had a few children, and it was a blessing to work alongside them with uh, donor and developer partnerships in our community. The last one, and hopefully a very exciting one for you, myself being the volunteer coordinator, uh, is volunteer opportunities. This group right here is actually Zanta of Traverse City, a wonderful group of women that came out and helped uh, do some yard work. But volunteering is, you know, you don't need any experience. You're here to make a difference. Come with a smile. Enjoy the participation. Meet new faces. There are many ways to get involved, whether it is swinging a hammer on the job site with some of our core volunteers who are 65 plus, I will happily say. Many of them have been retired for quite some time and have come out and, and helped us. We also ask for help with our gardening and landscaping. Meals really are a huge thing for our core group. It's really nice to have a, a community volunteer come in and, and provide you know, a couple sandwiches and a, and a few cookies and see the project and meet the crew that's out there that day. They really love to see the community embrace them as well as our restore, and that can include um, you know, moving a couple items into the store, whether it's little glasses or lamps, uh, 
uh, dusting items, just greeting customers, there is a volunteer opportunity for you. So please don't shy away thinking that you may not fit the perfect criteria because I guarantee I have something that you can do with me. And we'll have fun. We, I'll give you a matching t-shirt and we'll make a day of it. So thank you very much for having me here and we really appreciate the support of this church. And we hope we can continue to count on you guys in the future. Thank you, Victoria. We're going to do a little switch here now, so I'll come on down and hang out with you guys now. So, As I'm doing that, the kids can go on to junior church. I am so sorry that we're juggling things today, but we're doing what we can. So we're going to share just a few announcements before we do get started. Um, and I'm, A1 already left, didn't she? I, Jeremy, would you come up and get, a few weeks ago we gave out certificates for those that were baptized, and A1 and Jeremy were off in the Bahamas or somewhere. No, they were actually <laughs> maybe in Wisconsin or something like that. But um, So Jeremy and Eowyn both were baptized, uh, what, three, four weeks ago? So <clears throat> And then one just real quick. I don't like to necessarily do this kind of stuff here, but it's the only time that I kind of have everybody together. So... Um, when you purchase something for the church and you have a slip for it, please don't just put the slip on Terry's desk. Because what happens is it gets then put into the envelope for our um, accountant, and our accountant doesn't know if it's okay to pay that or not pay that. So then we're leaving that up to her to make that decision. So we don't need to do that. We need to two slots underneath the the box for our accountant are these slips and if you want a reimbursement or something if you've bought something you need to fill this out staple your slip to it put it on Terry's desk so then Terry can look at where it has to go in the budget and then she can slip it in the slot for the accountant, and then that tells the accountant that it's okay to pay it. Does that make sense? I mean, it's just it's just kind of a bookkeeping thing. We want to keep our um, our things straight, and um, so we just ask that let's make sure we do that, and so that way everything is on the up and up. Our accountant doesn't really like carrying the weight of making decisions whether to pay or not to pay, because that's not really her job. Her job is to pay the things that Terry or Lou tell her to pay. Okay? We good on that? Another thing, just uh, I've had a switch in my schedule. Uh, my other work, I've, I was working Tuesdays and Thursdays. They've asked me to change to thir Tuesdays and Fridays. So I'm no longer going to be in the office here on Fridays, but I will be in the office on Thursdays. So I'll be here Tuesday, Thursday. And then um, I will be at my other job on, now I, I will be here on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Bev gave me the look. It's like, nope, you're wrong. <laughs> I'll be at my other job Tuesdays, Fridays. I'll be here Wednesdays, Thursdays. Okay, does that, just to keep that straight and um, be in prayer for the Revnells there. Uh, in the air right now, flying to some extravagant island somewhere that they're going to snorkel and do all that stuff. So, um, September 22nd through the 24th, you have it in your bulletin. We we even give you a, an area to be able to see kind of who's speaking at different conferences. It's the Joyce Myers Conference, 40-year celebration. 
Uh, so we have on Thursday night, jo Joyce Meyer will be the one speaking at 8 o'clock. That service will be here. And then on September 23rd, on Friday at 10.30 in the morning, it'll be Joyce and Friends is what they call it. She'll be chatting with um, those that are there. And then after that, Joel Olstein will be speaking. In the afternoon session, Lisa, Lisa Harper. In the night session, um, Joyce will be sharing. And then Chris Tomlin will be doing a concert. And then on Saturday morning, Christine Kane will be speaking. And then at 2.30, Joyce Meyer will be wrapping it up. So, And the night one on Friday is kind of the 40th anniversary celebration. So you have that if you would be interested in, in giving Robbie a hand on details and getting stuff together for that. Please grab her after the service so she knows that she can have some others helping with that. Um, our, Bi our Bible study started this past Wednesday. Again, we're going every other Wednesday. We're going through 30 days to understanding the Bible. Um, so if you're interested in being a part of that, um, yes. It's the second and fourth Wednesday. Yes, because that does throw a curveball in sometimes when there end up being five Wednesdays in a month. So the second and fourth. So we met this past Wednesday and then we'll be meeting again, not this week, but next week. So, and um, we'll try to have those dates for you as we move along. Anything else? My goodness. You ever have that feeling like you are juggling, but you don't really know how to juggle, and yet you're trying to keep all the balls in the air? That's kind of what I'm feeling like right now. Um, so I apologize for that. We're going to be continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. But before I move on to chapter 8, I just have to take a couple of minutes and go back to chapter 7 for a moment. Um, we were talking about um, marriage and, and divorce and all of that last week. And there was a portion of the scripture that talks about... Um, if the wife is a Christian and the, the husband is not, that he is sanctified or he is, um, which made it sound like if you're a Christian spouse and your spouse is not Christian, the, the question is, is that just a free entry for the other spouse because their spouse is a Christian? And I just needed to clarify, that's not what the scripture is telling us. The word sanctified means set apart. So what, the, he, what Paul was telling them at that point is, if you're married and you can stay married and your spouse isn't a Christian, he still has to make some sort of a way that the children in that still have access to God. Does that make sense? So, and... If with a non-Christian and a Christian, they wouldn't necessarily have that access. So it says that he sanctifies them or he sets that marriage apart to at least salvage that for the children. It does. It's not a salvation issue. It's a law issue as far as what's happening there and then. So it's not a free entrance for the unbelieving spouse. They still have to reconcile with God. They still are the ones that are um, they have to speak for themselves. All this does is kind of puts an umbrella over their home of protection for the kids. Because if you take um, something broken and try to fix it with something right, it still ends up broken. So it, it's that covering that takes care of that. Is that, is that enough expl explanation to get us to, to grasp that a little bit? As I've shared before, this whole book of 1 Corinthians, again, is it, it's kind of a rapid-fire response of Paul to the letter that was written to him by the people in the church of Corinth. Remember, these are new believers. 99% of them were Jewish believers. What we would look at today, or we would call a messianic Jew or a Jewish person that believes in Christ as Messiah, 
Most Jews do not. They're still waiting for the Messiah. But Messianic Jews would be Jews that still practice because there are some wonderful, wonderful practices in the Jewish faith. But yet, it's not necessarily required of them because they've now been completed through the work of Christ on the cross. So there's these people in this church that all they've done before is all of the stuff that the Jewish culture did. So all the sacrifices, going through all of the ceremonies and everything else. And so that's why we're seeing all these questions. A few weeks ago we talked about circumcision and why was that important? Because in the Jewish faith it was. If you were born a Jewish child, you were circumcised. That was the way it was. And so it, it's... But yet it got to the place where everybody was saying, if you don't do all of these things, then you don't fit in. And Jesus came to do away with that. So here we are now with these Jewish Christians still trying to grasp everything that's changing in their life. And then they're living in a society that they're worshiping all kinds of little G gods. Remember we talked about little G gods. There's only one capital G God, the one true God. That's God himself. And now you got all these little G gods, and they're, they're doing sacrifice. They were still doing things similar to what the Jewish faith was doing, but yet just in different ways. So they have all these questions. So this comes to the place where they're now asking about eating food that's been sacrificed to idols. So this is how Paul addresses that. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 beginning with verse 1. Now about food sacrifices to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols, we know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, that's little g gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us... There is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom all or for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a, again, little g-god, and since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat, and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights do not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, but that person is emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols, so this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore... If what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause them to fall. Father God, we ask that you would just help us through the next few moments as we look at this scripture to try to unfold and understand uh, what Paul is sharing with these Corinthian people. We understand, again, that your word even these letters were written for a specific time to a specific people dealing with specific situations. 
And yet in our grasp of trying to understand everything about you, we have to find some way to even reconcile this type of thinking to the things of this day. So how do we do that? How do we make that clear in such a way? What can we glean from this scripture when we are in a situation in our lives where we don't even come across food that's been sacrificed to idols? So help us to understand this in a clear way that we may continue to learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What I've titled the message is The Difference Between Love and Knowledge. The Difference Between Love and Knowledge. Um, you know anybody that loves to chew bubble gum? And they love to chew it so much that they love to also pop bubbles all the time. And for some of us that that kind of popping kind of gets into our head real quick. It can get annoying quite quickly. But there's something about bubbles from bubble gum. When you're chewing bubble gum and you blow that bubble, as you're blowing it out, if you stop blowing, what happens? It begin, Well, that's if you blow it all the way up and let it pop. But if you think of this, because Paul talks about this bubble of knowledge, he says it puffs up. And, and when I was thinking of it puffing up, it just reminded me of that bubble. Because when you're blowing a bubble, you've got a big old mouth of bazooka chew, right? You've just pulled that out. You've got, you got it in your cheek. You're chewing that thing. You get it stretched out over your tongue, and you're like, <sighs> that thing starts to blow out. And if you stop blowing, it starts to suck back in and it gets shorter or smaller, right? But if you continue to blow, it just continues to puff up and puff up and puff up. And as it's puffing up, it kind of covers everything up behind it, right? So the person's face begins to disappear from this bubble. And then it gets to the point where what? It can't withstand it anymore and it pops and it just poof, right back on the person's face. And it's just no longer in existence, right? Well, that's what knowledge can do sometimes. It puffs us up. It gets us to the point where we think we're better than other people, that we, we begin to think, well, I know more than you know, and, and so I must be better. It must give me a better place into, into heaven or a better uh, choice of um, even where I'm going to, to end up. And it, it really has nothing to do with knowledge it has everything to do with love. So when we read the command, the greatest commandment, what is it? The greatest command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as, itself, as yourself. So that's the command. Is the command, no, get as much knowledge as you can possibly get because that's going to get you further in this world. So you just go after knowledge, and you go over top of anybody you have to crawl over top. You claw your way there, and you just beat your way there. So one day you're at the top. And guess what happens? You get to the top, and then you end up passing away, and everything you have is no longer, has nothing for you. It, it does nothing for you. Am I saying that it's, not, that it's bad to have that stuff? No, I'm not. I'm just saying that if our goal is always to continue to have more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge and we can't be obedient to what the Scripture teaches us, then our knowledge is nothing. You're just a smart person. We talked about in our class this past week about um, having understanding of things. And, and you can't have a greater understanding until you have a smaller understanding. And, and so in that process of learning that, it, it's not for the benefit of attaining more knowledge. It's for the benefit of understanding who God is. That's what this book is for. This book is 
a book of accounts of what God did, what God was desiring to do. You remember, it says in the Garden of Eden, he made man, and a little bit later he made woman as a companion because he wanted to have fellowship with them. God wants to have fellowship with us. He created us that we would be in fellowship with him. The whole Old Testament is a story of how much God wanted to be with his people and how defiled his people were and defiant to not want him. Oh, they'd go after him while they were in bad trouble. But as soon as things straightened out, they were running after their own things again. And then God would kind of let them go for a while. Fine, if you want to be that way, wander in the desert for 40 days. Just wander around because I was offering you everything and you were going to be with me, but you decided that that was too great for us to even accomplish. So now you experience this over here. And when they got to the place where they were tired of manna or they were tired of eating doves, like the food wasn't good enough for them, they began to get upset with God. And, and they even go as far as to say, why didn't you just leave us there as slaves? We've lived that way for 400 years. We're, we're, we're fine. And yet, how much do we still do that today? We, we have this knowledge of who he is, but if we don't do anything with the knowledge, it doesn't get us anywhere. They knew that God could do anything. They had walked through a river. Well, God held back the waters. They knew that he could do anything. Manna showed up every morning for them. That'd be like, you imagine just getting up in the morning and you don't have to go to the stove and whip up some eggs and bacon or whatever else. You just get up and, oh, here's breakfast. And you just pick it up and eat breakfast. Or you, you pick it up and have enough to eat for the day. The next morning you get up, oh, there's, there's more there. But because we are the way we are, we get bored with one thing, right? I don't, oh, I got to eat the same thing over and over and over again. How boring is that? But yet God has continued to want to be close to his people. Over and over and over again. He gave them things that he knew weren't even going to be best for them. They're going through life and they're like, oh, we need judges. We need someone to rule over all of this. And, and God's like, no, if you just seek me, you can handle this. And, oh, we want judges. Okay, if that's what you want, you can have it. Look what happens. You have these bad judges that just start tearing things up. Well, okay, we need a king. We need a king. No, you need me. No, give us a king. And what do they do? They end up again in exile. They end up separated. And then after about 150 years, they're all back into exile again. And they're all wandering around. So then God just leaves them be for 400 years. Can you imagine just God leaving them be for 400 years? And yet there still was a remnant that stayed true to him through that. And then the New Testament comes on the scene. And God again says, okay. I'm going to take care of this once and for all. I'm going to send my son. And he's going to give his life for you. And he's going to take all of this sin and all of that, and he's going to take it upon himself. He's going to take your guilty verdict upon himself and set you free. And the Bible goes on to say, In whom the Lord sets free... He is free indeed. 
So as he's talking with them and writing back in this letter, and they're saying, well, what about food offered to idols? And he, and he shares with them, it's more about how you treat people. It's more about how you care for people and how you look after people. We're supposed to be aware of our surroundings and the people that we're having dealings with. I shared with you before that when I got called into the ministry, the Lord was very clear to me that he didn't want me to listen to any secular music. He said, I just want you to listen to godly music, things that points toward me, because as you're going through this time of study, I need your complete focus on me. But what I didn't do is if I got in the car with somebody else and they had country music on, I didn't just blare out and say, well, that's terrible music. Turn that music off. I'm only going to listen to Christian music. Because we all know that whoever's driving the car is the one that gets to control the radio, right? So you can make a scene about it and actually push people away because you're claiming that, Oh, I have so much more knowledge. I know that it's better to listen to this music than it is to listen to this music. So, so you need to change this music. And, and in doing so, you can hurt a friendship. You can point them in a wrong direction. You're starting to tell them that it's more important about the, the little things that you do than it is seeking after the one that you're seeking after. So that's what Paul is trying to tell them there. You know what? Any food that's offered to any idol or God that's someone other than God himself, don't worry about it. If a God isn't really a God, then is the food really defiled? And the way that system worked at the time when they did these um, sacrifices, a third of the animal would be sacrificed a third of it would go back to the people and then the other third would be left with the priests the priests didn't have a job outside of their priesthood so that was a way of taking care of them you know when we talk today about tithe and why do i have to tithe and why is it important Because the scripture says it's important for the church to take care of its leaders and that a workman is worthy as hire. So part of the tithe is to pay for a pastor to be at a church. And that was happening clear back in Leviticus. That was clear back when the temple was created and the priest, their livelihood was brought to them through those that were bringing sacrifices. So where did they get their meat? They, they, weren't out, they didn't have cows and sheep and all of that. They were in the temple. They were working in the temple. So then they were taken care of. So a third of it was sacrificed, a third of it went back to the people, and a third of it went to the priest. Well, can you imagine if you're doing 100,000 sacrifices in a month's time, and you're getting a third of every portion how much meat you end up with? And how did they take care of things then? How did they preserve things then? Salt. But to do that in a large portion, I mean, we we bought a a quarter of a beef at the beginning of the year. We have a a stand-up freezer about like that, that quarter of beef filled that whole freezer. So now we have meat for the next year. I can't imagine you have a third being brought for every sacrifice, and what do you do with that? So what they, ha- what they would do is they would actually have restaurants within their, their temples. And we all like a deal, right? You know, if we can get something for a little bit less than something, we'll go for that. You know, if, if you want a, a nice uh, high money meal, you might do that for a, 
a special occasion, but why did McDonald's and Burger King and all of those things become so popular? Because it used to be you'd go to a restaurant and you'd feed your family and you'd spend a fair amount of money. You could get five hamburgers and five fries for three or four bucks and feed your whole family. You know, we, we like a good deal. Well, that's what these priests were doing. They were selling this food at a reduced price because it was something that was given to them. So they were then getting a profit from it, but they weren't necessarily looking to get the full profit. So even these Jewish Christians now are saying, hey, it's Friday night. I need to take my sweetheart out for dinner. I'm going to go over to the Temple of Zeus over there because they, they got some good meat over there, and I'm going to have my, my dinner. Yeah, I'm being a little sarcastic with it, but, but that's the essence of it. And, and this was becoming an issue with people. And, and what, God is say, what Paul was saying to them is, if this God is nothing then the meat was sacrificed to nothing. The meat's not defiled. Love is better than knowledge. And don't read into it. I'm not saying that knowledge isn't important. We need to have knowledge. But if we have knowledge and we don't have love, then the Scripture says we don't know the Father. And if we don't know the Father, then the Father doesn't know us which means when we take our last breath and we go to that judgment time we're going to hear the words depart from me i never knew who you were in ephesians when we went through the study of ephesians there's at one point where it says be therefore imitators of christ's love we always kind of take that as to be just imitators of Christ. That's where the, the WWJD bracelets come from. What would Jesus do? Be an imitator of Christ. How would he do that? But the essence of it is, is it wasn't saying being an imitator of Jesus. It said to be an imitator of Christ's love. And how much, how big was Christ's love? How big was it? How big is it? it? You can't measure it, right? His love was so great for us that it says with joy he endured the cross. His love is so great for you and I that he says, you know what, I love them so much, I'm willing to give up everything. And I'm willing to take on everything. And experience the punishment for it. Because I love them. And you know what? There's a lot of us. All of us. That did not deserve that. And yet there are times where we accept that love. But we look at somebody out here. That's done something terrible. And we say they're not deserving of it. And yet, none of us are. So what do we learn from all of this? We can get so caught up in knowing things. That we forget to practice loving people. So we begin to get very picky and fussy about even our traditions. And we hold on to them with clad gloves saying this is the way it's got to be. And yet sometimes by hanging on to some of that stuff, there are people that maybe will never see the kingdom because we couldn't let go enough to love deeper. No greater love is there than this, that one would lay down their life for a friend. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Why do we exist? Do we exist to come and meet together on Sunday mornings and and have our appetites moistened a little bit and and have our our traditions carried through, whether um, it be even communion or any of those things that are very important and we need to do those things. But what are we here for? If it's all about us coming to get what we want, then that's not loving people. Because there are literally people every day that are dying and going to hell. Sometimes because we've been so comfortable sitting in our churches that we don't take Jesus to them. If we live our whole life And are never very uh, never instrumental in loving people to the point of pointing them to Jesus. Then have we really lived? And I know it's hard today. It's so hard to share your faith today because there are so many different opinions out there. But if we truly believe that there's one God and that there's one way to heaven, then as a church, we're called to take this knowledge that we have, whether it's this much or this much, and take it to those that don't have it so that we can then begin to guide them into the process of receiving him. We have the great the great commandment to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Love our neighbor as ourselves. So that's our commandment. What's our commission? Go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and instruct them to the teachings of the disciples Make disciples. And that's what our call is as a church, to make disciples of all the nations. And it, what's discipleship? It's not just meeting for a Bible study. That's part of discipleship. But when he talks about baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, when he's saying to go, he's saying that we need to reach out to somebody we need to share Christ with them. We need to continue to have conversations with them and allow them to see Christ in our life that they would come to the place of saying, you know, what? I'm not sure what it is you have, but you have something. And what you have, I want. Then we introduce them to Christ. That's the first part of discipleship. But then we have to teach them the things that God has taught us so that they too can grow to the place of than them reaching out. It's a process from before salvation to salvation to sanctification and them saying, okay, now I'm going to go out and reproduce so that the church will grow. Not our church even, but the church would grow. That more would have opportunity to know him. That's what our call is as a church. To make disciples of all the nations to take what knowledge we do have and not have it puff us up into thinking we're better than everybody else but to take this knowledge and say okay I care enough about this person that I'm going to walk along beside of them and bring them up to this place if there's things they don't understand then I'm going to step back because I love them and not push my thing on them because I think that my knowledge is greater than their knowledge. God wants us to build the church. He wants us to build the kingdom. And it's not about just how many people we can get setting in a pew. 
It's about how many people we can get into the kingdom of God. Lord, we love you today. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for these examples that we have in Scripture, even though we don't understand them all times because they're dealing with situations that took took place so long ago that we don't really have an understanding of them even. And even as we try to grasp an understanding, we still try to really recognize how we can apply it to our lives today. And yet we do serve idols today. There are many things in this world that we long for and we reach for that are contrary to you. And as we talked about last week, Paul is asking that if you don't have to get married, not to get married because it takes away from fully knowing him and and serving him completely because now you have someone else to serve and to look after and care for. So Lord, help us to come to the place that we are putting you first in everything in our life. And we think about the things that we're going to do next, that you're in the middle of that, that you're the one that's being thought of first, and how can we follow in that way? We need your help. We're a fallen people that make mistakes and fall short. And yet you love us so much that you will continue to lift us back up and continue to draw us closer to yourself. May your spirit fall upon each of us afresh and anew. May we be concerned with our knowledge because we always need to learn more. We need to know you more and understand you more clearly. But may that knowledge never come before loving. Loving one another. Loving the ones that are hard to love. Offering love to those that we don't even know yet. Because in that it glorifies you and points people to you. Bless your people today, we pray. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.